afternoon, we are going to start the last, but not least, most interesting session of the afternoon, of the day, of the week. So welcome everyone. Um, for the session today, we are going to discuss and hear good practices working across sectors in different humanitarian crises. So we have discussed the importance of working integrated programming and we have three very good best practices um, that we're going to hear some highlights and then you will have time to ask some questions for colleagues. Um, my name is Sylvia and I work for Plan International but also co-lead the working across sectors um, and as I said we will have the different initiative um, that we will listen today on child protection, education, GBB and MHPSS uh, from the rapid integrated response from children in the Sahel to the unified framework on child protection, education and gender-based violence across conflict settings to the holistic support to children in the Ukrainian crisis. So we have three different examples but also with some commonalities. Um, I'll ask the panelists some questions that will answer in a brief manner and then as I said we will open for questions from you and I have the pleasure to introduce you to the panelists today so we have um, on my left uh, the first Marina Berbiek who is a protection gender and GBVIE specialist with 10 years of experience at field and global level in various crises and currently she's working with the global education cluster as gender and GBB specialist advocating for intersectoral collaboration. So welcome Marina for the panel today and we also have Amelie next to Marina. Uh, Amelie Holebeck, sorry for my pronunciation, uh, is a child protection expert with more than 20 years of experience in both development and humanitarian settings, working with different organizations and currently Save the Children Regional Child Protection based in Burkina Faso, supporting also integrated approaches. Welcome, Amelie. We're very excited to have you here. And we have um, also our colleague, Eleonora Mansi, uh, who is the Global Child Protection Specialist uh, for International Rescue Committee based in New York. And she's stepping in for her colleague, Jelena Petrochki, uh, who has more than 15 years of experience on child protection and education initiatives. We will have some videos and some um, in intervention from Jelena. Um, unfortunately, she couldn't be here today. She's the program manager with uh, IRC in Serbia and she oversees different projects uh, in the Balkans and the neighboring countries and has been working on innovation and working at multi-sectoral level. So without more Delays, I'm going to open and ask a question um, to Marina to tell us a bit more about the background and what is the initiative, what is the framework uh, working across sectors. Thank you so much, Sylvia. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I'm here as a GBV specialist on behalf of the Global Education Cluster. And you might wonder, why are we here? Um, a big theme of this week has been working across sectors and I was very happy to see that education has come up a lot as an extremely critical sector to work with uh, in collaboration with child protection actors. So at the GEC we have education clusters um, activated in nearly 30 countries and we have 60 global partners including the Alliance. As a global coordination body, we are a critical connector to mobilize collective action for education in emergencies. We believe that education is life-saving. We also believe that protection 
is life-saving, and that education is a means to protect children. So we leverage our network of specialized partners, which are often shared with the child protection sector thanks to our common child focus, so that education in emergencies can lead to protection outcomes, because schools and learning spaces are entry points for multi-sectorial service delivery uh, to children. And because we know that safe school environments are also paramount to children's uh, protection, well-being and ability to learn. So for all these reasons at the GEC, we've had a long-standing collaboration with the education sector. A few years ago, we co-developed the CPEAE collaboration framework uh, where you can find tips and tricks for education clusters and CPAORs uh, to cooperate across the humanitarian planning cycle. And we've also had in the past few years a needs assessment project which was joined uh, between education cluster and child protection AORs, uh, financially supported by BHA where we trained 12 countries on joint assessments, including elements of child participation and GBV risk mitigation. And we also provided direct support uh, to six different countries uh, to do those joint assessments. Recently, we are also striving to enhance our collaboration with the GBV sector too, because from all those recent assessments and primary data collection with children and adolescents, we have understood and we have gathered evidence that child protection and GBV factors, such as child marriage, are very often the main cited reasons for children to drop out of school, especially adolescent girls. Last year, we got a request for support from our teams in Mali. Mali has faced a multifaceted, long-standing humanitarian crisis, is suffering from structural inequalities, armed conflict, consequences of climate change. We have observed a surge in attacks on education, grave violations of child rights as well. 38% of GBV survivors in Mali are child and adolescent survivors, according to the GBV IMS. So there has been a recognition of the urgency and imperative to work across those three sectors. And uh, I will let you know about the initiative uh, in my next intervention and how we got to certain commitments and priority actions from those three sectors. Thank you, Marina. So um, maybe uh, moving on to Amelie, if you can tell us a bit more about the a bit of background, the Sahel crisis, and what is this rear uh, mechanism? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sylvia, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, share uh, the rear uh, mechanism. Uh, so just to give you a bit of background so we've been uh, working in the sahel so burkina faso mali and niger um, um, it's important to say that so i've been 20 years in the region and i think it's important to say that before the security and humanitarian crisis um, there was long-standing social cohesion in uh, the region and there was strong community mechanism in all three countries I think this is very important as a basis of also what is happening and how we are going to intervene. Since 2012, the, and uh, with uh, the collapse of uh, Libya, uh, lots of arms have been going down in uh, the region, starting by Mali and expanding to, to Niger, to Burkina Faso, where you have had uh, an uh, unidentified armed group's incursions. So those armed groups have created uh, terror, terror among the populations. And it's been, they have been creating pressures on livelihoods resources, preventing populations to cultivate, preventing people to be harvesting. So leading to uh, populations being, um, having no ways to survive than providing information to armed groups. So there were strong infiltrations in villages and crumbling the social ties within uh, the people. 
There was also uh, a will to destabilize the state uh, of those armed groups, so attacking schools and forcing social, uh, social and basic services to flee some areas. So we had some areas under blockades. So, of course, these situations caused a lot of displacements, uh, displacements of population towards uh, urban centers. And uh, among those populations, most of them were uh, women and majority of women and children. So we have about 2.7 million of IDPs in all three countries uh, and about 200,000 refugees. So this humanitarian situation is uh, 16.8 uh, million. Sorry, I think that's 16.8 million people uh, that are in need of assistance. So that's about 22% uh, of the total population of Sahel. And among of that, 33% uh, of the needs of the humanitarian needs are covered. I'm not talking about we had. Uh, uh, earlier yesterday, we had the, fund, the funding situation of the child protection, and it was 6 and 7% for Burkina Faso and Mali, and 17% and for Niger. So, um, coupled to that, because the, 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 there's a massive food insecurity, uh, 13,000, more than 13,000 schools closed, and uh, half of them are in Burkina Faso. Uh, affecting 2.5 million uh, children. So uh, the child protection situation is uh, quite disastrous. You have uh, serious uh, grave violations. Uh, CAFAG is a big thing. When you have no social services, you have no livelihoods, you have no school, it's not even a choice. Um, it's not even a choice for, for those adolescents. There's a lot of ab abductions as well, uh, SGBV, um, exploitation, worst form of child labor, unsafe migration, every sorts of possible uh, ways of surviving. So trafficking, lots of begging as well. Uh, on top of that, there's serious humanitarian access because uh, the state is trying to fight those armed groups. Um, and I think it's the peace was it was so peaceful the, the the countries and I think it's important to say that when those attacks came um, the colleagues couldn't believe it and they've been in denial for several years because it was quite n people could not believe it and um, so the, now we have issues with humanitarian access and the, the army fighting those armed groups. Uh, the army and the police, I mean, there's been lots of political crisis, lots of geopolitical issues as well coming uh, up into, into this setting. And uh, because of the political instability and the coup and the military regime, we have uh, observed also a lot of donors flee, f fleeing, I, I wouldn't say that, but withdrawing their, their support. Uh, putting the populations with uh, with even more difficulties because they have to, to 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 they have this humanitarian situation, the security situation, and the donor uh, leaving uh, other country. So in this uh, in this setting, uh, we have developed what we call the rire mechanism. Rire means uh, laugh in uh, in French. Uh, it's a rapid integrated response aiming to do child protection, MHPSS, and education. So basically, because there has been lots of displacement, um, then we had those assessments we talked earlier, uh, the transition spaces that we'll talk about, and, and then the education option. So basically, uh, those rear mechanism is to improve the protective environment, well-being, and learning of displaced children in the first three months of a displacement. So working with uh, communities, with uh, lo local, uh, local and humanitarian actors. I think I will stop there before. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Amelie. And now we're going to hear, we're going to play a video and hear from Helena who has sent us 
uh, her contributions to about the background in the Ukraine crisis. So let's... Uh, As we are all fully aware, in the wake of the Ukrainian crisis, a significant displacement of families have occurred, creating an urgent need for comprehensive support for refugee children. Responding to this crisis, the International Rescue Committee Serbia, in collaboration with 14 partner organizations across seven countries, namely Moldova, Romania, Bulgaria, Czechia, Hungary, Slovakia and Serbia, has dedicated so far more than two years to supporting over 10,000 refugee children. Our efforts have centered around creating more than 40 child-friendly spaces within the existing hubs, libraries, schools, youth quarters and reception centers. These spaces provide safe environments where children can recover and grow holistically. Given the trauma these children have been exposed to, a key component of our approach is the provision of psychological support, including psychological first aid, counseling and crisis interventions. In doing so, we employ innovative therapies, such as Canis therapy, which uses therapy dogs, Hedgehog therapy, and Huggy Puppy interventions to help children regulate their emotions. However, educational support is another crucial aspect of our work. We offer language courses and tutoring to facilitate language acquisition and academic success, while collaboration with schools helps create an encouraging learning environment. Cultural events and play-based activities promote social inclusion and cultural exchange. Additionally, field trips, spring and summer schools and camps provide opportunities for positive interactions and personal growth, helping children experience a sense of normalcy. It is worth mentioning that in providing this support to children, we strongly lean on RC evidence-based methodologies, healing classroom and safe healing and learning spaces. So far, we have also ensured that more than 400 children have received specialized support through referrals. To sustain and enhance efforts, we have conducted comprehensive training for more than 150 professionals, focusing thereby on child protection principles, particularly in emergency setting, creating child-friendly spaces, and effectively implementing RC methodologies that I have just mentioned. Through these initiatives, in a nutshell, RC Serbia strives to create an environment that mirrors the children's home, contributing thus to their well-being and helping them reach their full potential in newly occurred circumstances. Well, we really thank Elena for sending this video. Um, unfortunately, we won't have her for answering questions, but then we have, you know, her contributions, and Eleonora will be able to answer also and comment on anything on the program that also been supporting. So now we are going. Um, we really want to hear as well what we have learned, any successes and challenges uh, from the initiatives that you have explained. I believe you can maybe mention uh, about the rear mechanism, any of the um, successes and challenges. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, okay, so in so in uh, the rear, when you remember the the, the framework, the rear we had the, what we call the transit transition spaces so basically um, for education so the transition spaces the aim is to it's a return to learning of children 
so it's a safe space where you have multi-sectoral uh, uh, services, so child protection, MHPSS, mm -hmm. and, uh, and education. And I think, uh, so during the three months, and the idea is to have the, an option, an educative option at the end of those three months. So what wor that worked really well to have those uh, integrated services. I think something that was important also is to have the social-emotional social learning that was included into the return to learning program because there is proof that uh, those uh, children have been displaced. They've seen, uh, uh, sometimes they have lost a, a father or a mother. They've seen killings. They have been, they lost their social network. So it's very, they are not able to re-enter the school directly. So it's very, the social emotional learning um, activities were very important for them to, to be able to return to learning. So that was quite um, a success. Uh, then, in those spaces, there was also opportunity to, to identify the children that uh, were uh, in need of protection for case management or for referrals for psychological support. What worked also quite well was the profiling of children. So the profiling is actually at the during the whole uh, three months, we profile the children if they they are children who've never been to school, who have some level some. Uh, uh, what the level of school or if they if they are in a village where they have no access or what is the opportunity that would best fit them for them to to return to a, some kind of education um, I think something that was quite uh, good as well it was the increased buy-in of communities when we had child-friendly spaces community were saying okay that's great you make our children play but what's next what we have nothing what's what's good and and here the fact that there was education integrated there was more of a future there was something that you we would offer or something next so i think that was the this increased buying from the community was was quite important um and um i think also uh, if I have time, uh, the, the, what was important also is that the response was basing on the community, on the community. So not only targeting displaced communities, but also basing on the host communities and how people were uh, uh, working together and, and, and uh, addressing, the, the, addressing the activities together with the host and, yeah. Shall I go to the challenges? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, what has been more uh, challenges was, so the difficulties in measuring well-being. So how well-being uh, or uh, not being well can affect your learning abilities. So that was challenging to, to, to show that we have, we know we have testimonies, but to being able to assess that was quite of a challenge. Um, the high number of displaced children. We know that in our CPMS standards, we have 25 children. That's the ratio for one uh, facilitator. We had 400 children sometimes in, in uh, those spaces. So it's like, and, and it was very difficult. So sometimes you had uh, uh, eight years old looking after two siblings. So it's difficult. it was difficult to say no, we had to accept uh, children, but at the same time, it was difficult to, to, to manage the flow. Um, the fact as well that some uh, families were moving back and forth to, to their village because the, uh, then the armed groups have left, so they thought it was uh, safe to go back, and so it was difficult to follow as well. Um, one thing that was a bit tricky as well was when the formal system existed, which, I mean, you have heard that 6,000 schools were closed, so some schools were not there, but when the schools were there, so the school starts in October, so you could transfer a child up to November, December, but then afterwards, the, the school system was not accepting uh, displaced children, and already it was completely overcrowded, the classes. Uh, so that was quite tricky about how to do this transfer. And we are still progressing about on how to do this. Um, I think also two more challenges. <laughs> uh, 
Um, the delay, we would have liked to be quicker. Sometimes, you know, the three months we had given ourselves were, were I think we needed more guidance, more, more being quicker to be able to, to respond, and we're learning on that. The human resources, I think that's critical as well. We are, uh, we are operating in some areas where you have lots of different communities, different languages, very uh, low education. So how to transmit all this knowledge to be able to deliver three uh, sector activities? And I, I think uh, we're trying to address that. And I think I am stopping Thank there. you, Melina. <laughs> That's like plenty of successes and challenges. Thanks for sharing. And, you know, a lot of um, imagination also to interpret the icons here. <laughs> Um, we let's also hear from Jelena now if you, we can play the video number two and see what are what were the challenges and successes uh, for the Ukrainian crisis and see if there are some similarities or not. One of the significant successes in working across sectors to support refugee children in our CSOB approach is the establishment of child-friendly spaces and provision of the whole package of services within them. These spaces actually offer integrated services that addresses the comprehensive needs of children affected by crisis. By incorporating innovative programs and therapies, such as, for instance, Canis therapy and Hagipabi intervention, I already mentioned, we have been able thus to support emotional regulation and to promote resilience among children. Our integrative approach not only focuses on the children, but also extends support to parents and professionals working with them. This comprehensive support system actually ensures that everyone involved in the child's life is equipped to provide the best care possible. Additionally, for instance, the transformation of libraries into safe spaces has proven to be a scalable model, demonstrating that how existing community resources can be repurposed to meet the needs of refugee children effectively. However, despite these changes, we face several challenges, as we all do when working with children, particularly in emergency setting. Resource constraints remain definitely a significant issue, limiting our ability to reach more children and sustain our efforts over the long term. Meeting the diverse needs of refugee children who come from various backgrounds and have different experiences also presents a continual challenge and requires constant adaptation and tailored services. Sustainability is another major concern as ongoing support is required to maintain the services and programs we have established. Furthermore, effective monitoring and evaluation are also essential to ensure that our interventions are making the desired impact and to identify areas for improvement. However, limited resources and the dynamic nature of crisis can make it difficult to implement comprehensive monitoring and evaluation system. In a nutshell, while the holistic and integrative approach of ICE Serbia has led to notable successes in supporting refugee children, we must address the challenges of resource constraints, meeting the worst needs, ensuring sustainability, and implementing effective monitoring and evaluation to continue and enhance the vital work. It's great, and I think we are all nodding, and we can see some similarities with the previous presentation and some of the challenges and successes. If now, Marina, you can tell us um, about the successes and what you've learned and some of the challenges. Sure. So I gave you a little bit of the background and context of um, why we went to Mali to support EIE CP GBV collaboration, but how did we do that exactly? So in November, we organized a workshop 
uh, that brought together 30 stakeholders um, from the global and country level education clusters, CPAUR, GBVAUR, the protection cluster, OCHA, and government representatives from the Ministry of Education and uh, the Ministry of the Promotion of Women, Children, and Family Affairs to co-develop together a country-specific, context-tailored uh, collaboration framework. And for these three sectors, also to define priority actions and a roadmap to work together to advance on those priority actions in 2024 to ensure a more holistic, more comprehensive, more complementary and better coordinated response to the education and protection needs of diverse groups of children in Mali. So the three sectors uh, took five uh, commitments for 2024 because we have a much more comprehensive collaboration framework for the country now, but we also want it to be pragmatic and realistic. And we wanted to know, okay, what are we actually going to achieve together within the next year? So the first commitment was to conduct a joint analysis of um, the needs, barriers and risks faced by crisis affected girls and boys in Mali for their annual humanitarian planning cycle, including the identification of children of common responsibility. Second commitment was to systematically collaborate during the HNRP process, the Humanitarian Needs and Response Plan, and also the development of uh, strategies for their respective clusters and AORs. The third commitment was to tailor a joint child protection GBV referral pathway for schools specifically, and to strengthen the capacity of school personnel on uh, the referral pathway, how to receive disclosures from child and adolescent survivors, uh, including GBV, of course. The fourth commitment was to organize a joint donor roundtable and more broadly uh, to conduct collective advocacy and fundraising efforts. And the last uh, commitment was to establish a joint task force to guide the process and, and keep the momentum after the, the workshop. And I do want to mention that this workshop approach was also very much inspired by the work of the Alliance and by uh, our collaboration with the Global Child Protection AOR because we used and tweaked for our needs the training package for child protection mainstreaming in other sectors that was uh, very kindly shared with us uh, by Susanna uh, when we were developing our own uh, workshop approach. Some of the successes from that workshop is we've already seen within the last six months a more streamlined, a more effective, more coordinated approach to address uh, the needs, barriers and risks faced by children in Mali at the coordination level. So the three sectors have collaborated during the 2024 HNH, HNRP uh, process when they were writing their respective chapters. They made references to uh, sentences, narrative indicators, lock frames included in the two other chapters. They've also collaborated on a significant number of strategic documents of their uh, different clusters. During the annual retreat of the edu education cluster in December, the CP and GBV AORs were invited and led uh, CP and GBV thematic sessions. They also provided input to the education cluster's new strategy and new contingency plan, uh, where GBV against children was uh, clearly outlined as one of the most likely risks um, impacting education in Mali, especially uh, child marriage of adolescent girls. The protection cluster has created a work plan for 2024 that highlights the importance of working with the education sector uh, specifically. And during the annual retreat of the GBVAUR this year in April, there was also a thematic session on intersectoral collaboration with the education cluster at the forefront. The importance of intersectoral collaboration has also been highlighted in several advocacy, donor engagement and fundraising events uh, within the last six months. There was the UN uh, Open Day in January, 
ECW, Education Cannot Wait, which is the biggest donor for education in emergencies, just completed a mission um, in Mali and the three sectors also convened together and talked to the donor um, to highlight the importance of working across sectors. And finally, one of the latest uh, successes of this initiative is that the three sectors started working together on a joint protection referral pathway for schools, education personnel, parent-teacher associations, communities and children, as well as a standardized code of conduct uh, for school personnel, which did not exist or was not harmonized across schools in Mali until now. Thank you, Marina, for the very comprehensive uh, explanation. Um, I'm going to ask a last final question to panelists, but uh, I'm going to just like a uh, heads up that will be then opening for questions. So if you have any questions regarding the work that they're presenting or any of your experience as well working uh, in an integrated manner or um, collaborating with other sectors, we will be very interested to hear your questions or comments. Um, and the last question that we have for panelists is about, okay, now what's, what's the recommendation and what's the way forward? Um, and we're going to start hearing from Jelena about the example from the Ukraine crisis. So uh, we're going to play the last video from Jelena. recommendations and way forward to protect children in crisis. Well, building upon successful model developed by the IC Serbia, several key recommendations and strategies can be adopted to enhance the protection of children in crisis. I would say that one of the primary suggestions is to expand the child-friendly spaces approach in a way the IC Serbia is doing it. These spaces have proven to be invaluable in providing safe environments where children can recover and grow, and extending this model can benefit even more children in need. Enhancing psychological and educational support is another crucial step. By increasing access to psychological first aid, counseling and innovative therapies, we can better address the emotional and mental health needs of refugee children. Similarly, strengthening educational support through language courses, tutoring and stronger collaboration with schools can ensure that children continue to learn and thrive despite the disruptions caused by crisis. Promoting cultural and educational inclusion is essential for fostering a sense of belonging and normalcy among refugee children. Organizing cultural events, play-based activities and collaborative projects with local communities can facilitate social integration and mutual understanding. Moreover, ensuring access to specialized services through strong referral systems will help address the unique needs of each child, providing tailored support that can make a significant difference in their recovery and development. Working with hosting children and communities is also vital to creating a welcoming and supportive environment for refugees. Building relationships and fostering understanding between refugee and local children can help reduce stigma and promote solidarity. Advocacy for policy changes at local, national and international level is also crucial. Strengthening legal frameworks and policies related to child protection in crisis can ensure more consistent and comprehensive support for vulnerable children. By pushing for these changes, we can create a more secure and supportive environment for all children affected by conflict and displacement. In a nutshell, by expanding the child-friendly approach, 
in a way they are seen doing it, enhancing psychological and educational support, promoting cultural and educational inclusion, ensuring access to specialized services, working with host communities, and advocating for policy changes, we can build a more robust and effective system for protecting children in crisis, drawing from the successful model of RC Serbia. Wonderful. So a lot of advocacy for going forward and for recommendation. And I uh, want to ask uh, now, Marina, what about the recommendations and way forward from your side? Okay, so what's our way forward? Uh, first of all, we want to use and leverage uh, uh, of global coordination to amplify our impact and also generating evidence on how this uh, approach to strengthen intercollaboration, intersectoral collaboration works. So at the global level, the global education cluster, the global child protection AOR, and the global GBV AOR have embarked on quite an exciting journey together. We are planning to replicate this initiative in other contexts, learn from the field, using that bottom-up approach to bring uh, this good practice of intersexual collaboration between education, CP and GBV to scale uh, with the financial support of notably uh, ECW. We are continuing the support to uh, our Mali teams. We are also documenting the process of the implementation of the five commitments that they took. So we will be uh, publishing a case study, hopefully in the fall or at least by, by the end of the year, uh, in the hope that we inspire other contexts to be interested in replicating these initiatives um, in their own. So if you know any child protection actors that would be really interesting in working with education in GBV, please uh, give me a shout. Uh, we have already started to inspire others. Uh, we've already received an expression of interest from Niger to adapt uh, the approach to their context. Niger was one of the countries that was supported by the GEC and the Global CPAUR in conducting a joint needs assessment a couple years ago. Uh, so this already created more appetite in collaborating, continuing the collaboration between the two sectors and bringing in GBV. Why? Well, it's also anchored in evidence. In that joint needs assessment from 2022, nearly half of the girls that we consulted said that child marriage, a form of GBV, was the main reason for them to drop out of school. And 42% of our key informants also said that girls were at risk of sexual violence on their way to school. We also have a, a momentum in Niger for this initiative because Education Cannot Wait is now founding a new uh, three-year, multi-year resilience program. And they also really insist on the integration um, or working across sectors and the integration of gender, GBV, child protection, and MHSPSS components in the EIE response. Our medium to long term objective is to bring this uh, tripartite collaboration to global scale. Uh, we want to establish a global unified collaboration framework uh, for EIECP and GBV that would further promote cooperation and coordination and that will build on the existing bilateral frameworks between CPEIE and CPGBV. Uh, which would also demonstrate the global education cluster's strong and unwavering commitment to the centrality of protection, to GBV risk mitigation, and to provide holistic and integrated solutions uh, to crisis-affected children. Super, fantastic, a lot of good news and also very exciting plans. Um, and I promise this is going to be the last question. So this is the way for one recommendation for the Sahel crisis. Uh, so Amelie, tell us more. Yeah, so in short, um, so we actually presented the RIR in uh, her workshop 
and we are trying to influence for them to integrate MHPSS as well. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, uh, one of the key recommendations is definitely to work uh, more strongly with uh, clusters. And uh, for example, in uh, Niger, we've been also working with different, uh, uh, with other um, organizations as well to share uh, this integrate their integrated experience, field experience in bringing this integration. So it's how we we join up and uh, learn more from uh, from working in this setting. Um, very uh, one, one element as well that was uh, important is to um, to balance the fact that we need to be very flexible and adaptive to the situation, the security situation, the education opportunities that we find or that we don't, but at the same time bringing a lot of guidance because there's so much uh, lack of access, <laughs> difficult to monitor, difficult to coach people, so that it's, it's, it's good to have strong guidance, but at the same time this flexibility, so it's how to find this balance. And, and um, um, so uh, also the importance to be open to, so when working with other sector, it's important to understand the benefits, not being stuck in what we are trying to do. So for example, for child-friendly spaces, we call it transition spaces because education people could not identify or could not relate. So it's just moving a little bit on, on uh, but finding common objectives. I think that was, that was important. Work we have in progress, uh, so we are working on developing this well-being indicator to, to, to see uh, how this is also uh, affecting uh, education. We're working on developing an operational guide for those transition centers we talked about and a manual on pick and choose activities in the three sectors. That's for formal, for 6 to 12, but we are looking at developing something more on teenagers because we know that teenagers have also um, yeah it's another another age group with lots uh, lots of challenges as well so that's the next step thank you very much thank you very much and i'm going to ask everyone to give a round of applause for the great presentations Thank you so much. And now, uh, if there is any question, thank you, Susanna is going to support with the mics. There are also two there, over there on the table. Um, so if there is any questions, comments, I uh, can see one over there. Any other questions we can... Unfortunately, Marina is going to leave very soon. So maybe you can... Yeah, I must apologize, but I have to go to the airport. <laughs> Um, so I cannot stay for the Q&A sessions, but if you have any questions, give me a shout. Uh, you can get my email, my Zoom, my Skype, my WhatsApp. I'll be very happy to chat, but I have to run. Thank you. I totally understand, but we have, so we can get Marina um, virtually, wish you like safe travel. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question in relation to the project um, uh, in Mali, the cluster of, uh, of education, but she just left, but... Oh, uh, she's... <laughs> it's, um, so I, I just wanted to know how they conjugate uh, this with the security situation, uh, because in a big part of Mali, especially in the north, the whole area of Tombuktu, Kidal, Gao, all that area, it's... Uh, very difficult to access. I was there last year. Um, the schools, uh, most of the schools didn't have teachers. There was a need of hundreds of teachers. Uh, the schools had been closed for several years before because the extremist groups that were in the area wouldn't allow children to come back to school. It was after the communities had done a huge advocacy process that they agreed on to, under certain conditions to reopen the school. So there's like a big gap of years that children had lost. Um, but still, uh, it's it's a very difficult area to access. It's um, uh, for for both reasons uh, because physically it's very it's it's very complicated. Most of the time you need to go by air, uh, and then in terms of security, it's very it's very dangerous. Um, so I, I was wondering if, if this is also uh, 
happening in those areas, or I mean, if it's in the whole country or only in areas where the government has um, effective control and there is, I would say, the security situation is, is more stable. Um, uh, and 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 then um, I I um, I I I, I, I because. She mentioned also that the schools are used as referral pathways for uh, GBV situations and all that. So uh, I presume that uh, in those areas that are very difficult to access, that, that might not be functioning at the moment. So uh, what I want is, is, is an, uh, perhaps an overview of uh, how is it being implemented like in the whole country. Thank you very much for your question. What we can do specifically for the specific initiative and the specific location areas, my sense is not covering the whole country, but we can you know, have the information specifically on which areas. But Emily, uh, not specifically on the pilot, but can provide more information about the security and the access in Mali. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, I cannot, I cannot answer for Marina. I can answer, for example, on um, the, specific, uh, the, the specific initiatives that we have. We are trying to look at, uh, for example, Quranic uh, opportunities. So in terms of education alternatives or education opportunities, because as you rightly said, uh, the, the, the armed groups are preventing uh, in some areas for, from, um, from uh, children accessing schools. So we are looking at uh, distance education where access is difficult. We are looking at, um, uh, we are looking at uh, uh, Quranic schools. We are looking at, uh, you know, providing uh, temporary or catch-up classes, you know, these kind of sorts of, but in terms of uh, systems, uh, it's in some areas, and where, what I'm talking here is Mopti, uh, Bancas, uh, Koro, uh, and and but to, the other uh, places you're talking about is, is much north, much further north. So this, the work that Marina has been doing is at cluster level, so it's more a strategic work. Strategic level. <coughs> Not a question, but interest. I would really love to see the well-being indicator tool that you have developed. We developed a similar tool that we are piloting, and actually, Eleonora sitting next to you worked on this with our measurement team. So it would be good, and we are piloting it. So it would be good to see what you're doing, how you, what you're learning, and uh, we can exchange notes and see how to strengthen this because it's we notice it's a gap in our programming. Thanks. Sorry, since. I just wanted to apologize because my colleague couldn't be here, uh, Yelena. I could have, of course, spoken about the project, but I really wanted to give credit to the team, and especially because it's a complex project. And maybe just to add a bit more on the project, because I don't cover the region also. I used to cover it, but not in the past few years. And so when I saw like seven countries, 14 partners, I was like, how did they pull it off? And so, like, I ask a big question in terms of staff management and everything. And so, like, they had a really multi-sectoral team in different specialties. One was education, child protection. They had a specialist on GBV. They had a psychologist. They had, like, a legal counselor and, like, um, somebody on livelihoods. These were all IRC staff based in IRC Serbia who were then traveling and doing like monthly like monitoring chats, visits to the different countries and to the different partners. And they trained all the partners on like this, especially because this is really fully a partner led or operation. Like we were just the technical support. We did not implement anything without the local uh, different partners in the different countries. So I just wanted to specify that. Thank you. Do we have any anyone that wants to also share uh, any similarities from their work or any questions to the panelists? Thank you, ladies. Um, I guess for me, it's just we also work in the region that you are referring to in the Sahel. 
and I know how difficult it is to get funding for that particular region, whether it's child protection or the work we do in nutrition or even for education. And I also know that um, the education spaces have been used a lot by the insurgents to also come in and, and um, um, adopt children. So I just want to say a big thank you to the to the team because we are we are also in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, and we've been really struggling in that region. And I think just today, as we were here, uh, they issue a new HRP for the region. So still more need and no money. So we do have a serious challenge. And I think at New York level, we've tried to highlight this crisis a lot at some of our meetings, just talking about how under-resourced and how most time we refer to the Sahel as the forgotten crisis. So thank you and I look forward to our collaboration. Oh, and I'm from Child Fund Alliance Space in New York. Thank you, Faye. Can you speak at all a little bit more on the focus on adolescents, either challenges or successes? I think often we see that it's considered or is easier to work with younger children, um, but the work with adolescents requires a bit more adaptation, and then also you get into the requests and need for maybe livelihood support, which doesn't always get funded alongside the child protection sector. So um, when you talk about focus on adolescents, um, is there anything else that you can add to that about how we could all do that a little better? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we start, so I think what we could see is that uh, in those spaces that uh, there was less and less children, uh, adolescents, sorry. And I think that also was very worrying because that meant uh, the, the adolescents were looking at uh, all sorts of uh, uh, negative coping strategies that I talked about in relation to uh, unsafe migration, CAFAG, uh, um, and, and all sorts of things because there's very little uh, opportunities. So um, when we're looking at ad for adolescents, I think so that's why we didn't want to merge just the things when we're looking at activities and operational guidance. And uh, there's a strong uh, identity and MHPSS that um, uh, part of the work that we're looking at. Uh, because the, and that's in relation to CAFAG, you know, and how you identify with uh, one group and another. There's just, it's a strong communication war as well, and a strong, there's strong pro propaganda. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be built there. There's a lot of work that needs to be built on strengthening the resilience, uh, how to, um, uh, to, to make children, uh, um, uh, be aware of their inner abilities, their capacity, their social network, so how, how we're working on that. But we need to be working as an integrate, uh, in integration because there's, there's literally very, very little things, food insecurity, very basic needs that uh, are not there. So it's really, we, it's, it's not by diminishing child protection. There's definitely child protection image PSS activities that need to be there, but we cannot do that without uh, 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 key livelihoods, uh, uh, opportunities or, or, or uh, educational activities or some kind of, uh, you know, looking at the future for those adolescents, I think. So. So the project wasn't just focused on adolescent. I think it was focused on five to 17 year old. Um, I think there were some activities that were more geared towards adolescents. For example, there was coding and robotics IT. Um, so these are for older children. Um, and then other services were provided to everybody, like psychological support. Of course, the level of discussion and conversation and session that you can have with adolescents is very different from 
a six-year-old child. Um, I don't think it was provided livelihood. I think livelihood was more for the parents because one thing that she did not mention is that there were side-by-side -side activities for mothers in some of these spaces. And so that's why we had GBV like as well and maybe livelihoods to ensure. Um, but I know that they were also supported in reintegration into school regardless of the age. So I think these are the things that we did for adolescents. Gracias eh, por contarnos su experiencia. Eh, bueno, un poco desde la experiencia que hemos tenido, hablo específicamente en World Vision Colombia, algo que nos ha permitido llevar la intersectorialidad es la capacidad de adaptarnos y de flexibilizar, que de hecho es una de las recomendaciones que estaban colocando también eh, para tener, este en cuenta, tener en cuenta este enfoque intersectorial intersectorial eh, y quería preguntarles porque en eso los desafíos es cómo hasta qué punto uh, flexibilizamos frente a una planeación unos marcos lógicos unos indicadores que ya tenemos establecidos entonces cómo lo manejaron en el marco del proyecto y de la experiencia que nos traen esa flexibilización, esa capacidad de adaptarse para igual cumplir con las herramientas, los indicadores, los marcos que tenemos, pero permitiendo esa intersectorialidad que pues pone como en el centro a la niñez, ¿no? Gracias. I think that was one of the challenges uh, in the project mentioned is because like there were different phases in terms of the response and so at first when um, the kids weren't allowed maybe in some countries to go immediately into school and so the needs of the children kept changing and so the program needs to change as well. Um, in terms of m &E, that was also kind of a challenge just because we were working with local partners who were not necessarily used to work with refugees and in humanitarian response and so unless we told them all everything pre post test or like the basic of m &E, they weren't used to use it i think to be honest the framework was pretty broad that allowed us to make those changes in due course i don't think there was any indicator who particularly like blocked us from changing what we were doing um, in that and we also had individual responses that allowed those changes and of that flexibility to support the needs of the children um, but there was a challenge i'm not sure if i answered fully your question but okay uh, so um, for us i think uh, the, in terms of uh, indicators we tried so at the beginning we have a holistic assessment tool so that's what we try to and I mean, it's completely imperfect, but it uh, deserve, it exists. Um, so at the beginning of the REAR mechanism, we have this holistic assessment tool. And at the end of the three months, we have also the holistic assessment tool. It's looking at uh, assessing uh, the well-being, assessing the, protective, uh, the protection of children and uh, the education. Though in the three uh, months time, it's difficult also to, ac to uh, assess the educational uh, abilities and to see a progression in three months, especially because the aim of those transition spaces is to stabilize the child and um, yeah, mostly uh, prepare the child to return to learning. But we did, so we did have uh, this tool, this common tool for, and some indicators we try to follow but uh, as you say, it was, uh, the importance was to be very adaptive and flexible. And along the, so it's the fourth year we've been uh, developing this project and we've been adapting, uh, you know, the, 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 the indicators. Now, what we have found, and that's what I was talking about, the recommendation, we have been consultative and very open about this REAR mechanism. But now we need to reconvene, learn, and provide more guidance. Because on, in the field, when there's a new displacement, we need to make sure that we can train all the staff with all the learning we've been doing. And that's why we're developing this guide. So it's a balance between getting the right balance between providing clear directions
but at the same time being open to to those options. Thank you, Amelie. Um, just to wrap up, I want to say how important it is to have these specific examples and good practices and also the challenges from practitioners. So something that we have discussed at the Working Across Sectors Advisory Group is to document good practices so that can be shared, they can be you know, uh, used for learning, but also the challenges and requests and you know, that you mentioned as well from World Vision Colombia and from others. So please uh, be in touch and you know, let's share what's working, working across sectors, but also some of the challenges that we are facing. So together we can see what has worked in one place and what all the resources that needs to be developed. So with that, I wanted to wrap up and thank you our panelists for sharing all these wonderful experiences and an applause for you and thank you so much. We're going to have now 10 minutes before the plenary session so we can all stand, uh, talk to each other a bit and get some uh, water and fresh air. Thank you.